year is 1989. Superhero movies would never be the same because Tim Burton gave us a dark look at Batman, starring Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson. Kevin Costner would hear the whispers. If you build it, he will come. Giving us one of the best sports dramas ever created. Morgan Freeman would play Crazy Joe Clark and Lean on Me and provide my favorite movie quote of all time. You know what he's saying right now? Bastard can't throw me out. You know where he's saying it? Out in the parking lot. And while John Cusack was winning Diane's heart with a slice of Peter Gabriel cheese and a boombox and say anything, a troubled man named Robert John Bardo was dealing with his own sense of rejection. This is the story of Rebecca Schaefer and what happens when fame and obsession meet head on. I'm Justin Harvey, and you're listening to Death in Hollywood. Robert John Bardo was born in 1970. He was the youngest of seven children. His family moved around a bit before settling in Tucson, Arizona. When Bardo was just a child, he was abused by at least one of his older siblings constantly. When he was 15, he threatened suicide, so he was taken from his home and placed in the foster care system. During this time, he was also institutionalized. He was diagnosed as emotionally handicapped and suffered from manic depression. Many of his family members also seemed to suffer from mental illness and were labeled as pathological and dysfunctional by people who knew them. Shortly after his release from the mental health facility, he would drop out of school, despite earning high marks. He would find work as a janitor at a local jack-in-the-box. Bardo, a ninth grade dropout with a menial job, found his escape through TV like so many of us do. He became obsessed with the Samantha Smith story. Here was this beautiful young girl, full of virtue, doing her part in brokering peace between the United States and Russia amidst the Cold War. She appealed to Bardo's weird sense of morality and the cruel world he knew. Unfortunately, this amazing little girl's life would be cut short in a plane accident in 1985. Bardo would have a few other fixations after the death of Samantha, but in 1986, an up-and-coming model would catch his eye. Rebecca Schaefer originally had aspirations of attending rabbi school, but began modeling in her junior year of high school. She appeared in many department store catalogs in her home state of Oregon and even landed a few commercial spots. This local success led her parents to let Rebecca move to New York City by herself in 1984. She went there to pursue her modeling career. Rebecca had the looks, but struggled to find work considered to be too short for the fashion industry. She stood at only 5 foot 7 inches. She would land a television role on ABC's One Life to Live, which lasted about 6 months. She would continue to hunt for modeling work while waitressing to make ends meet. She would even move to Japan in 1985, hoping her height wouldn't matter and she could model there. When that didn't work out, she came back to New York and put her focus into acting. In 1986, she landed the cover of Seventeen magazine. The world wouldn't be able to ignore her beauty anymore. I'll place photos of her on our Instagram page. She was perfectly sun-kissed, the curly big hair that was a staple of that late 80s fashion, piercing eyes, and a bright white smile. That smile that made her look like the picture of innocence, that classic girl-next-door look. TV producers would see it too, and some of these TV producers were casting a new sitcom called my sister Sam. They would ask Rebecca to test for the role of Patty. She would win the role, playing Patty, a teenager who moves to San Fran from Oregon after her parents' death to stay with her sister Sam. Sometime in 1986, Bardo would see Rebecca on My Sister Sam, and he would begin obsessing over her. She was the new picture of morality for him, a character that had suffered the heartbreak of losing her parents Maybe something Bardo wishes would have happened to him. A character that has a healthy and humorous relationship with her sibling. Maybe something Bardo was jealous of 
because of his childhood experiences with his siblings. He would start sending flowers and letters to Schaefer. Most were intercepted by the show's handlers and agents. One letter must have made it through, though, and Schaefer's fan service returned a letter with a glossy photo of herself for the fan. I can only imagine what this meant for Bardo. Let me be clear, I'm no psychologist, but this probably made someone with obsessive disorders that he clearly had feel validated. Bardo, armed with this new sense of validation, would head to Los Angeles. He would find his way to the Warner Brothers studio and try to get on the set of My Sister Sam, holding a teddy bear and a love letter. Security would stop him from getting on set. Just another super fan that they've encountered dozens of times before. This security stoppage angered Bardo. How could his love not want to see him? Why wouldn't she tell security to expect him? Or let him through, he wonders. A month later, he would try to get on set again. This time, Bardo didn't bring a teddy bear. He didn't bring a love letter. He came armed with a knife. He would encounter security again, and they would be able to stop him before he gained unauthorized access to the set. This, along with the cancellation of My Sister Sam, made Bardo shift his focus for a time. He shifted his attention to other notable women of the time, Madonna, Debbie Gibson, and Tiffany. Meanwhile, Rebecca would continue to try to climb the Hollywood ladder after the end of the sitcom. She would show up in the 1988 movie, Out of Time, and film a spot in the movie, End of Innocence. Rebecca would become the spokesperson for the charity, Thursday's Child, a program to help teens dealing with mental health issues, such as body shame issues, child abuse, and dating abuse. Things were looking up for young Rebecca. She would also have a small role in the 1989 film, Scenes from a Class Struggle in Beverly Hills. This film showed Rebecca in a love scene with a male actor. Upon seeing the movie in 1989, Bardo was enraged. He would become fueled with hate for Rebecca. How did the object of his obsession, the representation of what he thought morality to be, how could she be in a scene like this? How could she become just another Hollywood whore? You can't do that. You are better than that, Bardo thought. Anger building. He can't control himself. Bardo must punish her. Bardo, obsessed with TV and pop culture, remembers back to the actress Teresa Saldana. In the early 1980s, actor Teresa Saldana was a star on the rise. Her roles in Defiance and Raging Bull brought her fame but it also brought her the attention of a mentally unstable man named Arthur Jackson, who believed he was the benevolent angel of death. In 1982, his pursuit of her would turn violent. Arthur would hire a private investigator to dig up info on Saldana. The private investigator found an unlisted phone number for Saldana's mother. With that info, he then called the mother, posing as Martin Scorsese's assistant who she had previously worked with on Raging Bull, and was now becoming a superstar director. He told the mother he needed her daughter's home address to talk to her about replacing an actress for a film role in Europe. He then went to the house and waited for her outside of her West Hollywood apartment building. When she appeared, he walked right up to her, his politeness masking his intentions. Excuse me, he asked, are you Teresa Saldana? Yes, she replied. Her identity confirmed, Jackson began stabbing Saldana with a hunting knife. He stabbed and slashed at her so hard and so often that his knife bent. Hearing Saldana scream, Jeff Finn, a delivery man, rushed to her aid and wrestled the weapon from Jackson. By the time paramedics got Saldana to Cedar sinai Medical Center, most of the blood had drained from her body and her heart had stopped. Finn's heroism heart, lung surgery, and 26 pints of blood saved Saldana's life, but barely. Jackson was convicted of attempted murder and inflicting great bodily injury, and received a 12-year prison sentence. At the time, that was the maximum sentence for that crime in California, and now carries a penalty of life in prison. While he was in jail, he continued to make threats against Saldana. Fearing for her life, Saldana advocated against Jackson's scheduled 1989 parole, a situation that drew attention to the legal system's difficulties in caring for violent, 
and mentally ill offenders. He ended up serving additional time for making death threats, and in 1996 was extradited to England to stand trial on an unrelated 30-year-old murder charge. Though he was found not guilty, it was due to diminished responsibility, and he spent the rest of his life in a psychiatric hospital. He died in 2004. Teresa would live until 2016, when she passed away after being hospitalized for pneumonia at 61 years old. Little known to her or Jackson, this plan would inspire Bardo, who would take a similar path. Bardo would formulate a plan laid on the foundation of Arthur's groundwork. He would seek out a local detective agency in Tucson. He'd hire them for a fee of $250 to find out where Rebecca lived. The detective was able to get Rebecca's address from the California Department of Motor Vehicles for only $4. When Robert John Berto tried to purchase a Ruger GP100 357 Magnum at Jensen's Firearms in Tucson, Arizona in the summer of 1989, he filled out the paperwork answering yes to have been committed to a mental facility. This is a disqualification. He was also underage, but he had a fake driver's license and it probably would have worked. The salesman, a member of the Air Force named Bob, told him he could not purchase the revolver. Bardo got irate and said he wanted to fill out another copy. The salesman sought out help from a co-worker named Jerome. Jerome told the guy absolutely no way, and he told Bardo he could not own a firearm and get the heck out of the store. Jerome said he did not like the vibes he got from him. The two men then escorted Bardo from the store. Jerome, his friend Bob, and the manager on duty at Jensen's that day hung Bardo's disqualified form on the bulletin board at work and wrote, Do not sell to this individual. The next morning, Bardo came in with his brother, who purchased the same Ruger GP100 revolver and gave it to his brother when they were outside of the shop. This is a violation of federal law. His brother would have known that because it asks you the question on the form and warns that this is a straw man purchase and is a violation of federal law. When he gets home, Bardo writes a letter to his sister living in Knoxville, maybe becoming aware of the fact his obsession had reached its boiling point. In the letter he says, I have an obsession with the unattainable and I have to eliminate that which I cannot attain. Now armed with information and a Ruger 357, Bardo was ready to head to Los Angeles one more time. It's July 18th, 1989. Bardo rolls into West Hollywood via bus. It was a five and a half hour trip. Building himself up with what to say, wondering how Rebecca will react to him showing up at her home. Even though the detective agency had provided an address, Bardo began asking passerbys if they knew Rebecca and if this is where she lived. Now confident he had the right place, he approached the door of Rebecca Schaefer and knocked. Rebecca answers the door, and according to Bardo, they spoke about the photo he had received from her. She was pleasant, as was Bardo. Well, that's according to Bardo. She ended the conversation with a smile, wishing Bardo well, and shaking his hand. After she shut the door, she had to get ready. Today was a big day. She had an interview with Francis Ford Coppola that afternoon. See, the critically acclaimed director was casting for the final installment of his biggest work, The Godfather. Bardo heads to a nearby dinner while Rebecca is getting ready. Sitting there eating breakfast, he remembers he had a letter and a CD he had meant to give Rebecca, so he decided to return to her apartment. Bardo knocks on Rebecca's door again. This time Rebecca answers only wearing a bathrobe. Bardo's nervous, thinking wrong time, wrong time, she was showering. Rebecca said, you came to my door again? A little agitation in her voice. Hurry up, I don't have much time, letting out a soft sigh. Bardo would tell a police interviewer, I thought that was a very callous thing to say to a fan. Bardo, obviously dismayed with her remarks, an attitude towards him, decides it's time. He pulls his gun from a paper grocery bag he's carrying it, lifts his arm, and fires into Rebecca Schaefer. 
She begins screaming and crying. Why? Why? Bardo stands there frozen. His ears are ringing. His face is covered in a cold sweat of panic. And he asks himself, what do I do now? Maybe I should blow my head off and fall on top of her. Bardo recomposes himself and takes off down the alley beside the apartment complex. A rider who lives across the street had heard what he thought was a car backfiring and walked outside to see. This is when he heard Rebecca's screams. The rider looked down the aisle of the complex and seen a woman's leg sticking out of the door opening and seen a man in a yellow shirt with short kinky hair running down the alley. One of the neighbors had already called 911 and paramedics arrived quickly. Rebecca would hold on for a short while before passing away at Cedar sinai Hospital. The next day, back in Tucson, several motorists called 911 to report a man running around in traffic on Interstate 10. It looked as if he was trying to get hit. He confessed immediately to Schaefer's murder. Arizona police faxed his photo to Los Angeles and witnesses confirm his identity. In court, he appeared dazed and confused. I could probably tell you what I did after I killed her, how I got sick and all that, but I don't feel like it. He would be prosecuted by Marsha Clark, who would later become the prosecutor on the O.J. Simpson trial. Bardo's lawyers would admit he killed Rebecca, but argued a defense of mental illness, even having renowned psychiatrist Park Dietz testify for the defense. Dietz said he suffered from schizophrenia. Dr. Dietz is the same forensic psychiatrist that reviewed the cases of Jeffrey Dahmer, the Iceman, and the Unabomber. When Marsha Clark was prosecuting Bardo, the Jensen's people, you remember the gun store earlier, contacted her office and heatedly argued the point that these two went out of their way to break the law and scam a firearm for Bardo, and that his demeanor pointed to first-degree premeditated murder and accessory to first-degree murder. Their voices fell on deaf ears, and his brother was not charged. Ultimately, Bardo would be convicted of capital murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In July of 2007, Bardo was housed in a maximum security unit for inmates with sensitive needs, including former gang members, notorious prisoners, and those convicted of sex crimes. It was that year he would receive what some call prison justice. The State Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation said he was stabbed 11 times in the prison yard while inmates were on their way to breakfast. Two inmate-made weapons were found at the scene. The suspect in the attack was identified as a man serving 82 years to life sentence for second-degree murder. Bardo was treated at the University of California and returned to prison. He's still there today at the Avenal State Prison in Avenal, California. Following Rebecca's murder, California laws regarding the release of personal information were radically changed. The Driver's Privacy Protection Act was put in place in 1994, which prevents the DMV from releasing private addresses. Her death also led California to implement the first anti-stalking laws in the country in 1990. The LAPD would also develop the first threat management unit. While her death is a tragic story, it started the conversations of the seriousness of stalking and the dangers of mental health. At the time of her death, Schaefer was dating director Brad Siberling. Her death influenced his film, Moonlight Mile, which came out in 2002, about a man's grief after his fiancée is murdered. And shortly after Schaefer's death, Pam Dauber and her My Sister Sam co-stars Joel Brooks, David Naughton, and Jenny O'Hara filmed a public service announcement for the Center to Prevent Handgun Violence in her honor. Rebecca was gunned down when she was only 21 years old. While she was not what was considered an A-lister, who knows what life had in store for her. You'll be missed, Rebecca Schaefer. Rest in peace. If you like this story, please hit subscribe and leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen.
If you really like this story and want to help us grow, please share it with just one friend. You can join the conversation by following us on social media. And if you'd like to support the show by being a producer, you can PayPal us at deathandhollywood at gmail. And you'll be listed in the credits of the next show.